This is Secular Founding Period History, and my name is Tony Messina. And welcome to another presentation of America's Lost History and the Creation of the Declaration of Independence by Tony Messina. Paradigm Shift In 1962, Thomas Kuhn coined the phrase, Paradigm Shift. Think of a paradigm shift as a radical change from one way of thinking to another. It's a revolution, a transformation, a sort of metamorphosis. It doesn't just happen, but rather it is driven by agents of change. This very Declaration of Independence is nothing short of a paradigm shift in the history of mankind as Jefferson, a primary agent of change, implies while reflecting on the event in the following letter to John Cartwright. Thomas Jefferson to John Cartwright, June 5, 1824, reflecting on the events of 1776. Our revolution commenced on more favorable ground. It presented us an album on which we were free to write what we pleased. We had no occasion to search into musty records, to hunt up royal parchments, or to investigate the laws and institutions of a semi-barbarous ancestry. We appealed to those of nature and found them engraved on our hearts. Yet we did not avail ourselves of all the advantages of our position. We had never been permitted to exercise self-government. When forced to assume it, we were novices in its science. Virginia, of which I am myself a native and resident, was not only the first of the states, but I believe I may say the first of the nations of the earth which assembled its wise men peaceably together to form a fundamental constitution, to commit it to writing, and place it among their archives where everyone should be free to appeal to its text. And appeal they did. Committee appointed for the writing of this Declaration of Independence. There is yet another Declaration of Independence that took place in this period we will discuss later. Primary author, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. Co-editors, John Adams of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin, Pennsylvania. Non-participants, Roger Sherman of Connecticut and Robert Livingston of New Hampshire. Part 1, Jefferson's Agenda and the Paradigm Shift. Part 2, Document Review. Part 3, Language Review. Part 4, Handwriting and Rough Draft Analysis. Part 5, Appendix with Altered Title and Related Information. Part 1, Jefferson's Agenda and the Paradigm Shift. Jefferson and the Paradigm Shift, the approach to July 1776, comparably the American Rubicon, this point of no return, July 4, 1776, was a moment that can be compared to that irreversible act of treason, Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, this act is nothing short of treason to your country, and after the fact you are considered a traitor. Before July 4, 1776 was an era known as the colonial period in which subjects of the king, subjects of the state of Great Britain, were forced to do the bidding of the kings, which included the perpetuation of the institution of slavery in the colonies. Slavery was stole upon us by the kings of England. During this period, Jefferson's focus was centered around two major issues, one of the independence of the colonies and the other of the emancipation of slaves. This event actually includes Jefferson's third anti-slavery effort before America was ever a country. As a subject of the king, Jefferson composed a very anti-slavery rough draft of the Declaration of Independence. Before this moment, he was a subject of the King of England. After this moment, he becomes a traitor to the King of England and a self-governed American. Jefferson's rough draft of the Declaration of Independence not only separated the king from the colonists, but he was also clearly using it in a third attempt over his seven-year agenda to put an end to slavery. 
Two months before the adoption of the Declaration of Independence in May of 1776, Adopted as an individual act by a state, the Virginia Constitution, with its Declaration of Rights, established the natural right of self-determination and state independence. Language from this document will be used in the Declaration of Independence. This document contained absolutely no anti-slavery language in it. This fact would not make Jefferson happy at all. Sometime before May of 1776, Jefferson penned a constitution for Virginia that was never adopted. Nonetheless, it had a prohibition of slavery clause. Pay close attention here and understand that adopting a constitution that did not prohibit slavery did not go well with Jefferson. We will see that he would later respond by removing the word free from his rough draft and I contend that this is why he did it. The First Continental Congress was established in 1774 and finally circa 1769 seven years before there was ever a Declaration of Independence and five years before the First Continental Congress, Jefferson appealed to his King of England for the emancipation of Virginia slaves. 1769 marks the beginning of Jefferson's 40-year-long anti-slavery political career. And, on top of that, he was the country's very first honorary member of the Continental Congress five years before one existed. Let it be clearly understood, years before the colonists ever had their freedom from England, Jefferson was working to gain the freedom for Virginia slaves first. Jefferson, acting alone as perhaps the very first volunteer member of a Continental Congress that did not yet exist and proving himself to be the first American, he boldly and apparently without any fear of retribution appealed to his King of England for the emancipation of Virginia slaves. Question is, when freed, where shall they go? Part 2 Document Review here we are looking at a photocopy of the Declaration of Independence. It's the signed version that is in the museum. This presentation will explore in great detail the creation of this document from its source language to its final edited version you see here. The very first thing to point out is that this document is all about the States of America. More precisely, the 13 United States of America. This entire document is basically about the independence of these United States of America. State independence. These independent yet United States of America, which differs from the United States of America of 1787. This newly acquired independence involves assuming the status of self-determination by the states. There is no mention here of any kind of authority being created beyond the states, federal or otherwise. Simply put, this declaration is all about defining the fundamental natural right of both the independence and self-determination of the states. Okay, here we see the lowercase united is used as an adjective, not as a noun, as it is with the title, name, or style of the United States of America, which differs from the United States of America, as we clearly see here. In Jefferson's rough draft, it was uppercase by mistake, but as we see, it's correctly altered to lowercase here. Here we see two corrections. One was a misspelled word, while the other a word was left out. Above, we see in the final Committee of the Whole House version from what was Jefferson's rough draft, all words are uppercase, laws of nature and of nature's God. Below we see in the rough draft that Jefferson simply referred to the lowercase version of a non-attached deistic form of a god, or more humbly put, 
Laws of Nature and of Nature's God. Document Layout. This document is layered Preamble Language, Core Legal Language, Complaint Language, and Closing Language. And here we can see in the total words of each layer that the complaint language is more than twice as much as the rest of the language. The core legal language is the most important language in the history of mankind. This is because it's these very words that define our independence and our status of self-determination. This presentation is made up of five prepared documents to review. They are color-coded, yellow, green, purple, blue, and gray. We're going to look at these in detail. And the first in the very middle is Jefferson's rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, which is followed by two edited versions, one of which is altered by Franklin and Adams. And finally, the alterations by the Committee of the Whole House, the final version of the Declaration of Independence. Next to the left, we see source language, which will include Jefferson's fair copy Constitution for Virginia of 1776. It was never adopted. And the Mecklenburg Resolutions of 1775, America's first Declaration of Independence which is followed by the Constitution of Virginia of 1776, Declaration of Rights, by George Mason. These five documents do have titles. It is A, B, C, D, and E. It's 1 of 5 to 5 of 5. In Jefferson's Rough Draft, there are 1,523 words. Then in the final edited version, there are 1,320 words, some 200 words less. In document D, altered by Franklin and Adams, they added one clause plus three key alterations. And then in document E, the committee of the whole house removed six clauses and altered some. And now we will look at the language in document A, 105. A. 1 of 5. Extracted from Jefferson's Fair Copy Draft Constitution for Virginia, 1776 never ratified, and the Mecklenburg Resolutions of 1775. What you see here is the A document with language on it designated with A. In this we have yellow language. The complaint language goes from A1 to A22. And then we have A23 from the Mecklenburg Resolutions, which has a closing line eerily similar to that of Jefferson's. Now we will look at language from the B document, the Constitution of Virginia. Document B2 of 5, extracted from the Constitution of Virginia, May of 1776. We see the green language box here. This is from the Declaration of Rights from Virginia. The Constitution had a Declaration of Rights. Section 1, 2, and 3, the very beginning of the document, spells out several things that Jefferson's going to paraphrase into the Declaration of Independence. We'll go over this language in detail in a few moments. Also in the document here, they had the identical language in their Constitution for Virginia that Jefferson had. And I contend that the language originated in Jefferson's Constitution, therefore remaining identified as a language. Now we will look at Document C, the language of Jefferson's rough draft. It's five pages in all. Document C-3 of 5, Jefferson's original rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, as submitted to Franklin and Adams for alteration. We will be looking at the language in detail in the language review. However, you're free to stop the video at any moment and look at any page and line as you like. This is page 1, page 2, page 3, page 4, and page 5. 
Okay, this is document D, alterations by Franklin and Adams, five pages. They added one clause plus three key alterations. D, four or five, this copy of the Declaration of Independence altered by Franklin and Adams as submitted to the Committee of the Whole House for final alterations. This document is shaded blue for Adams and Franklin. Everything in this five pages that has blue on it is the result of the influence of Adams and Franklin. We see two things staring us in the face right here. Page one, there are two alterations made by them that were noted. Page 2, page 3, page 4, and finally page 5, where you can see an alteration and an addition, the addition of D1 for Adams and Franklin. And finally, document E505, alterations by the Committee of the Whole House, final version of the Declaration of Independence, it's five pages, removed six clauses, and altered some. And document E505 uses a gray shading for all the alterations that are done by the Committee of the Whole House. This is page one. And this is page two, showing some language has been removed by the Committee of the Whole House, Congress. Page three has no alterations. And here we see in page four that five clauses have been removed by the Committee of the Whole House, especially C-15, the anti-slave clause. And finally, the page five of document E indicates there were no changes by the Committee of the Whole House on this page, and this ends the document review section. Part three, language review. Opening line, when in the course of human events, Jefferson's rough draft reads, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for a people to advance from that subordination in which they have hitherto remained. Then the Adams and Franklin version changes it to read, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. A notable Jefferson clause. Accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more likely to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Core legal language. Here we can see the four versions that came to be from starting with Virginia's Declaration of Rights, section 1, 2, and 3. Jefferson paraphrased these three sections into five clauses into his rough draft and then there was alterations by it by Adams and Franklin and then the final version by the committee of the whole house as you know it to be today we're going to look at this language in incredible detail in just a moment here we're going to examine all of the most important parts of it starting with the Virginia Declaration of Rights May of 1776 section 1 that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety section two that all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people that magistrates are their trustees and servants and at all times Times amenable to them. Section 3. That government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community of all the various modes and forms of government that is best, which is capable of producing the greatest degree of happiness and safety, and is most effectually secured against the danger of maladministration. And that, when any government shall be found inadequate or contrary to these purposes, a majority of the community hath an indubitable, inalienable, and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish it in such manner as shall be judged most conducive to the public will. Simply take notice of the word majority here. It will disappear. Jefferson's Rough Draft, July of 1776. 
B1, that all men are created equal and independent. B2, that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable. B3, that among which are the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. B4, that to secure these ends, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. B5, that whenever any form of government shall become destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Changes by Adams and Franklin. B1. That all men are created equal. B2. That they are endowed by their creator with inherent and inalienable rights. B3. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. B4. That to secure these ends, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. B5. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute to new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Simply consider Jefferson's use of the words the preservation of life. Final version by the Committee of the Whole House. B1, that all men are created equal. B2, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain and unalienable rights. B3, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. B4, that to secure these ends, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. B5, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. That all men are created equal, a language evolution. That all men are created equal. Okay. Jefferson's paraphrasing of the Virginia Constitution's clause starts with that all men are by nature equally free and independent. This is what Jefferson had to work with in the beginning. Then Jefferson alters the clause to read that all men are created equal and independent. He changed the words by nature to created and he removed the word free. Next, Adams and Franklin removed the words and independent, rendering the clause as you know it to read today that all men are created equal. That's how we got the wording. Are all men equal and are all men free and independent? Let it be known that to Jefferson the words all men meant all men, black men included. But unfortunately, apparently, all men may not be equally free and or independent. Jefferson doesn't like what he sees in the use of the word free. While black people were still enslaved under the Constitution of Virginia, so in order for him to save face in his choice of words here, he will have to leave the clause in as truthful a way as he could, so his final wording was to remove the word free, because if black men to him are considered to be in the ranks of all men, then it's impossible for him to accept the use of the word free in his version of this clause. If in fact black people were still slaves and not free, this would conflictingly imply that all men men are in fact not free. So the word free goes out the door as it directly conflicts with the words all men. Scholarly speaking, if Virginia had prohibited slavery in their constitution, Jefferson would have left the word free in his rough draft. Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams were all three known deists. Therefore, my view of their use of the words by nature and created here is this creation is by nature's God, not the Old Testament God of Abraham. Keep in mind that all mentions of deity in this entire original document in the original handwriting of either Jefferson, Franklin, or Adams are all lowercase words. No uppercase words at all. Mentions of deity. From Jefferson we get a single lowercase mention of the laws of nature and of nature's God. 
From alterations by John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, we have three mentions of deity in their use of the words that they are endowed by their creator. That, along with two final mentions of appealing to the supreme judge of the world and having a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. These are the four mentions of deities in the document. This mention of Creator here is taken directly from the Declaration of Rights in the Constitution of Virginia, wherein it states that religion or the duty we owe our Creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Their Creator or Our Creator They could have written that we are endowed by our Creator, as in the Virginia Constitution, but they did not. Alterations by Adams and Franklin. Three major alterations. C1. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. B2. That they are endowed by their creator with inherent and inalienable rights. And C27. Appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. One single clause added was D1 with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. It should be duly noted that both Adams and Franklin did not touch C-15, the anti-slavery clause, which in itself clearly implies that the clause was okay with them, as both men, especially Adams, who never owned any slaves, were indeed anti-slavery minded, which gives us a sum total of at least three major players of the founding period that were, by their words and actions, anti-slavery minded. Alterations by the Committee of the Whole House. Removed by the Committee of the Whole House, the next two pages show us the six clauses that were removed by the Committee of the Whole House. And the most noteworthy of these next two pages and six clauses is C-15, the anti-slavery clause. And it reads, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This poetical warfare the opprobrium of infidel powers is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this execrable commerce, and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die, he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us, and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them, and murdering the people of upon whom he also obtruded them, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. And here we see the other three clauses that were removed by the Committee of the Whole House, C-20, C-22, and C-24. Jefferson's choice of words here has brought a lot of negative backlash on him. But keep in mind that in his day and time, this clause passed both Adams and Franklin's scrutiny, and then it passed the committee of the whole house to boot. Apparently, all men were on board. To see Jefferson's choice of words here helps us clearly see that both the country and the world our founders grew up in was a very, very different place 250 years ago. This is the one clause that did not need to be here. A-19, he has excited domestic insurrection among us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. The Mecklenburg Resolutions 
At the end of the Declaration of Independence, these are the final words. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. In a document known as the Mecklenburg Resolutions, we find the final words. We pledge to each other our mutual cooperation, our lives, our fortunes, and our most sacred honor. Which is very interesting. The Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence is claimed by some to be the first Declaration of Independence made in the 13 colonies during the American Revolution. It was supposedly signed on May 20, 1775 at Charlotte, North Carolina by a committee of citizens of Mecklenburg County who declared independence from Great Britain after hearing of the Battle of Lexington. If the story is true, the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence preceded the United States Declaration of Independence by more than a year. The authenticity of the Mecklenburg Declaration has been disputed since it was first published in 1819, 44 years after it was reputedly written. There is no conclusive evidence to confirm the original document's existence, and no reference to it has been found in extant newspapers from 1775. The flag of North Carolina bears the date of the Mecklenburg Declaration, May 20, 1775. Former President Thomas Jefferson, principal author of the United States Declaration of Independence, suspected that the Mecklenburg Declaration was a hoax. Statement of Purpose The Declaration of Independence is basically a statement regarding state-level independence. It's neither a federal level or a national level or a confederated level of independence. This document is and was, strictly speaking, a state-level independence statement. The states were united together to declare their independence. It was an agreement that each state had the total right of self-determination, as you will see, it says so. The following language also signifies the transition from the use of the words colonies to states. It's found here in the closing language of the document. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. End of language review. In conclusion, the great bulk of this document can be credited to Thomas Jefferson himself. Adams and Franklin tweaked some clauses, then the Committee of the Whole House removed several large chunks, including the anti-slavery language, but the most important takeaway from this entire document is to be found in the core legal language, wherein the rules of self-determination and independence, as paraphrased from the Constitution of Virginia's Declaration of Rights, are declared, established, and printed in black and white for all the world to see and for all of humanity to embrace. This paradigm shift in the history of mankind marked the end of a life under the rule of a king or a dictator. This one body of language marked the beginning beginning of a life of self-determination for an independent-minded people that mean to be free. But you must work to keep this status of self-determination as it is not self-maintaining and it can and has in many ways already been altered and or even stolen from you. Glaring proof that America's actual beginning is rooted in documents that were first adopted in Virginia is found with this core legal language from the Constitution of Virginia of 1776. This would end up being copied into many other state constitutions thereafter, and even throughout the world too. It's this language that provides a foundation for all that we decide to do each generation, or rather, self-determination is the fuel of liberal flexibility that truly free and democratic societies both depend on and thrive on. Part 4 Handwriting and Rough Draft Analysis 
On the next two pages, I offer a handwriting analysis of both Adams and Franklin to see which gentleman it was that altered Jefferson's rough draft. And here we have a sample of Benjamin Franklin's handwriting to compare to the alterations in Jefferson's rough draft. And if you ask me, I would say that John Adams' handwriting looks more like the alterations. And here we see the first two pages of Jefferson's rough draft. And here we see a photocopy of the second two pages. From the alterations by Adams and Franklin, we find in the document at various places brackets that designate suggested language to be removed by the Committee of the Whole House. These two examples shown below were removed. Part 5, Appendix. Altered Opening Title and Related Information. Altered opening title, an exercise intended to determine the proper title names. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America is rather questionable. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United Colonies of America might be a little more accurate. Keep in mind that only two states, South Carolina and Virginia, had constitutions at the time of the adoption of this document. So what states is he talking about? To say the unanimous declaration of the 13 United Colonies of America is also rather improper. It implies the 13 in difference to the 14th or the unanimous declaration of 13 United Colonies of America. By removing the word the, it's not anchored to anything. Next, the unanimous declaration of these 13 United Colonies of America would give it a more pluralistic implication. Or also it could be written, the unanimous declaration by the people of the 13 United Colonies of America. However, it could not be the people because a large number of the people were loyalists, loyal to the crown living among the community. This declaration was a treasonous act, therefore it could not be produced by the people in general. Therefore the use of the word people here is neither logical nor appropriate. Or it could be written, the unanimous declaration by the Continental Congress of the 13 United Colonies of America the Continental Congress was a precursor to the federal government and would be appropriate for whom this declaration was directed by. It could read the unanimous declaration by the Continental Congress of the 13 United Political Societies of America. It's James Madison that teaches us that the states were simply political societies, not sovereign nations. Or, finally, it could read more properly, the unanimous declaration by the Continental Congress of these United Political Societies of America. Number four might be the most proper title. Related information. Here we see that if Madison had his way, we would have put language from the Declaration of Rights of the Virginia Constitution into our preamble of the United States Constitution. His version would read, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Be it hereby understood and established that all power is originally vested in and consequently derived from the people, that government is instituted and ought to be exercised for the benefit of the people, which consists of the enjoyment of life and liberty with the right of acquiring and using property and generally pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety that the people have an indubitable, unalienable, and indefeasible right to reform or change their government whenever it be found adverse or inadequate to the purposes of its institution. The United States of America is the title or name of the federal government. Some claim the Declaration of Independence is the preamble to the federal constitution, and in actuality, it really is. This illustration merely points out the uh, original states of the founding period that did copy Virginia's Declaration of Rights into their constitutions. We can see the few that did, 
the dates that they did and compare it to the Declaration of Independence and the Federal Constitution. This is Secular Founding Period History and my name is Tony Messina.